So we are now in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3, 4, brethren. And God says, with the same call that he always gives to the backsliding daughter of Israel and the backsliding daughter of Judah. If, verse 1, you will return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me. And if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. They should not be moved. In other words, they will not be taken away from their place of habitation. They will not be taken away into captivity. Because later in the chapters, brethren, especially chapter 13, we will see that the darkness of captivity is going to overtake the house of Judah and the city of Jerusalem. If you will return, there is always the hope, <laughs> the hope of Israel. Yes, the hope will be fulfilled. That's why we call the library the hope of Israel. But in Israel will return after learning its lesson the hard way. If you will return, there is always the hope that if there is significant enough numbers to repent, God will change his mind. He wouldn't go against prophecy, but he could make things go from this world through to the kingdom. Right. If. But the chances of national repentance in modern Israel, as you can see in all of your nations, is very slim. There are no significant enough numbers, sadly, to repent. Well, God will nevertheless spare those who do repent rather than the whole society. So those individuals in the modern Israel who do repent, God will spare them, but he will not be able to spare the whole society. Return to me. These are admonitions, brethren, to repent. Because what does it mean to repent? Teshuvah in Hebrew means to turn around and go the other way. That's how we return. From a wrong way, we turn around and we return. We go the other way to God, back to God. The abomination that Israel has to put away are especially terrible. He speaks about sins, lawlessness and iniquity. But now he's talking about abominations. So certain things were so terrible that they were abominations. And he says, then you shall not be moved. So they will not be moved out of their land by being captured by their enemies. They would avoid captivity if they repent. But yes, we know again, chances are very slim for the national repentance. But yes, there is still chance for personal repentance nevertheless. And as you know, brethren, I've been... Uh, with your help and Dr. Thiel indeed with our help common, we've been doing our best to send the warning to call to repentance to all Israelites and all the world we've been doing it and thankfully God willing very soon we might be able to do it on an even greater scale if this mighty door of shortwave radio opens before us I cannot even describe to you how excited I am about all that I'm as excited as I, I can be and yes, if you did not guess by now, the voice on behalf of the Continuing Church of God, the most present voice on that shortwave radio on our behalf would be my voice. But after all, brethren, I thought perhaps I've qualified for it because perhaps I'm not, I'm not sure if I share this with you, but there is another channel that I founded with one of my friends from Canada, uh, another YouTube channel that he that he founded on, on our behalf because we were hoping to also make some kind of organization called Hope of the Hope of Israel with hope to spread the good news. He founded the YouTube channel with the same name, Brethren, half a million people listen to my messages in English language. Half a million people from around the world. So I thought if half a million people found my voice pleasant enough to listen to, understandable enough to listen to, then I thought, well, I guess that gives me a good qualification for worldwide radio audience to listen to me and to understand what I have to say. When I say understand, I mean understand it in English because many people have English as their second language or a foreign language which they learn. But, you know, understandable enough from my mouth to understand what it is and what I try to convey by reading and interpreting the Bible. Uh, verse 2. And you shall swear the Lord lives in truth in judgment and in righteousness. The national nations shall be blessed themselves in him, and him they shall glory. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and do not sow among horns. Well, here is the word ish. So thus says the Lord to ish, 
to the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Verse 4, circumcise your, yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts, you men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn so that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Well, this circumcise, circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your hearts. That is unusual terminology, wouldn't you say? The only other place spiritual circumcision is indicated like that is back in Deuteronomy. Now, can you imagine that even in that is said in the book of the law? You know, circumcise yourself and take away for, of your hearts, foreskin of your hearts, not of your flesh, but of your hearts. It says even in the book of the law. Amazing. Well, check it for yourself if you wish. Because they talked about the spirit, circumcision, Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 16 and Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6. I, I tend to kind of read those things for you, but no, I, I thought perhaps I should just give you, give you the references so that you can jot it down and check it later, brethren. So can you imagine that even in the book of the law? But this is of course spiritual circumcision, circumcision in Jeremiah. That is not talking about a physical nation, but a people becoming, or a people becoming converted, you see. That was the only way you can circumcise yourselves of the heart. The only way. And do it, lest my fury come forth like fire. In other words, lest you experience the seventh last plagues, that will fall upon this world just prior to Christ's return. You better circumcise your hearts if you are going to escape the fury, the seven last plagues. That fury, brethren, is going to come like a fire and no one can quench it. So this is another good verse for hell. <laughs> what is hell? Well, hell, it is something that burns forever and ever and ever, right? It is... No, it's not something that burns forever and ever and ever. Not at least in Bible terminology. No, it's not. It is something that burns without anyone being able to quench it until it does its job. Once it does its job, it will be, it will just simply go out by itself. Now, God said that Sodom and Gomorrah suffered as an example of the eternal fire. But brethren, if that's true, well then something is wrong. Are they still burning? No. No. And people are not even sure where Sodom and Gomorrah were really located. So they are, they are basically on the bottom of the Dead Sea. But that is where they are, and that is where they were. When fire from God comes, it burns up. Nobody quenches it, you see. And God repeats that in the Bible. He mentions that throughout the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah, there is unquenchable fire. Unquenchable until it just burns up and does its job. It is the fire that no one can quench it because of the evil of your doings. And again, we see the elements of the New Testament here in the Old. Remember how I told you. The elements of the New, well, uh, how does it say? In the, in the Old, the New is contained, and in the New, the Old is explained. Here we have one excellent example, don't we? We see the elements of the New Testament. Circumcise your heart. Is that not what happens in the New Testament when a believer enters into the covenant with God through baptism? Yes, that's exactly what happens because Jesus Christ then spiritually at that point circumcises the believer's heart. So here we have a New Testament philosophy, if you wish. It shows us what people should be doing, not just to be Physically, the people of God. Verse 5. Declare in Judah and proclaim in Jerusalem and say, Blow the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together and say, Assemble yourselves and let us go into the fortified cities. Now, when God says something over and over again, it is just for emphasis, you see. Verse 6. Set up the standard towards Zion. Take refuge 
do not delay. For I will bring disaster from the north and great destruction. Brethren, it always, it is always the same direction where destruction comes from. It's never east. It's never east, and I mentioned that because we analyzed today in Serbia, the other chapter of Jeremiah. Brethren, it's never east. Jeremiah constantly keeps saying the north, the north, the north, the north. It's not the east, like the Western false propaganda keeps caring you about. It's east, it's China, it's Japan, it's Russia. No, brethren, it's not. The threat coming against the modern house of Israel and the modern house of Judah is from the north. Has always been, will always be. Remember, they'll, they'll, they'll fly quickly like an eagle from the north. Brethren, which countries have eagles as their national em emblems? Which countries in Europe? No other countries, but two countries in Europe, Austria and Germany. So it's always the same direction. The final punishment to the house of Judah and the house of Israel is going to come on them from Europe. From the place they would least suspect. It says, I'll bring this out from the north. And the land will end up in great destruction. Verse 7. The lion has come up from his thicket. And the destroyer of nations is on his way. He has gone forth from his place to make your land desolate. Your cities will be laid waste without inhabitant. Oh. Just like what we read in Ezekiel 6.6. 6. We all remember that, but it's easy to remember 6.6. 6. Your cities were laid waste. That was impossible until the 21st century. Now we have, as we, can, as we have seen already in Ukraine, for example, we now we do have weaponry strong enough to lay the whole city's waste. Just look at the beautiful city of Mariupol that I mentioned to you so many times over the few past months. And my heart breaks when I mention that city. Just look at Mariupol before the war, before this conflict. Just look at how beautiful that city was. And now look at the rubble that is in that city. Thanks to the Nazi ideology of the Ukrainian so-called defenders. And thanks to the, of course, the uh, efforts, war efforts on the part of Russians to capture that city because it is basically part of the ethnic uh, Russian populated area. In any case, in this only day and age, there is weaponry long enough with atomic nuclear hydrogen bombs that can now lay the city's whole city's waste. In a moment, in few moments, it was impossible back in the Middle Ages. It was impossible back in the 18th century, brethren. This was the prophecy for our time. It is possible now in our time. Now, the lion mentioned in Israel 7 uh, is the famous king Nebuchadnezzar of the ancient Babylon. And this is an analogy of Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king at that time he was on rise. King of the beast equals to lion. He was head of the kingdom. And he was even head of the beast. He was that gold. Now the destroyer of the nations, he says, is on his way. So that great future destroyer of the house of Israel, brethren, is going to be a resurrection of the old Babylonian empire. And as I have just mentioned, this adverb, Babylonian empire, you can just imagine that the Babylonian, the new Babylonian empire will have the same dominant old Babylonian religion. Which book have we been provided this week, brethren? The book called the Babylon <laughs> Mystery Religion, describing exactly the European Catholic religion. So what does that tell you? If the old Babylonian religion had the Babylon, uh, the Babylonian Empire has a Babylonian religion, the new one will have the same religion. So where will be that the new Babylonian Empire? Well, Europe, of course, because which do, which church is dominant in Europe? Oh, Catholic indeed. You have the Catholic Church, then you have the Orthodox Church with some slight doctrinal differences from the Catholic Church, but they're basically and mainly one and the same. So the whole Europe is under the grip of this of this Babylonian religion, brethren. So here is where the destroyer of the house of Israel is going to be. 
what we are seeing before our eyes. We see the old Babylonian Empire now being resurrected, brethren. It's called the European Union right now. But so far, it says, have you seen the end of the, the, the end of April? Have you seen what was the conference in Europe called? It's time for the United States of Europe. Here they are. And interestingly enough, they've agreed upon joint armed forces, meaning European army, brethren. For for decades, the Church of God has been telling the world that one of these days we will see the European army marching on. Here it is coming, right before our eyes, in our time. So you see, the destroyer of the nations is on its way. So that the future destroyer of the house of Israel is going to be a resurrection of the old Babylonian Empire. Here it is. Nebuchadnezzar is the head of it all the time. And anyway, it's coming from the north. It's not from the east, it's from the north. Again, which religion is dominant on the north? Which religion is dominant in Europe? Brethren, we know it is Catholic Church. How simple, how logical. I always told you, and will always be telling you, we need to use the common sense, brethren. When you're exposed to any kind of doctrine, you first need to use the common sense by what you already know from the Bible itself and from the history. Once you combine the Bible and the history, the true history, there is no doubt. Once you combine those two and use the common sense, nobody can deceive you, brethren. Nobody can deceive you. You cannot fall into any other false <laughs> ideology because it doesn't make sense. And in doing so, in, 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 in serving God, be creative. Don't be afraid. You see, have you ever thought that we would ever hear a, a special music by a pop and rock band? Have you ever thought it was unimaginable last, last century, for example, in the last century, but you see, things have, have changed. The times have changed. We came now to the point that, yes, even a pop and rock kind of band with this kind of beautiful song, so unusual for the Serbian area, could be played as a special music because it conveys the most beautiful message in Serbian language, though, but nevertheless with a very pleasant melody that everybody can hear and perhaps even kind of uh, sense what... The song is all about because I gave you the main gist of the song. You see, it's creative, isn't it? It is. Why should we be? Why should we be slaves to uh, 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 rules and rituals and regulations that make no sense? Just like God did not, you know. Well, I mentioned this because in the past, in my previous church affiliation, when I asked why should we not, why should we not play certain instruments for special music I, I i i got interesting response you know well then the question will be what kind of what what other instruments could we play i ask particularly about the drums because drums can be played very pleasantly and give very pleasant sound very uplifting sound and beat if you wish oh, but then the question would be what other instruments are we uh, can we play? It we would open a can of worms, I was said. Can of worms. What do you mean, a can of worms? Brethren, if we use all the instruments to the glory and honor of God, then what kind of can of worms are we talking about? And after all, why should we only use a piano for church services? Why should we? It's okay, beautiful piano, but why not other instruments? I've seen when I was in Latin America, people, you know, play hymns and they played on guitars. Beautiful. Why not? Oh, I was told that no, we would open a can of worms. What kind of response is that? You know, what kind of rigidity is that? Please don't be rigid, brethren. We are here, we are given freedom to God, by God to be creative. You know, when I was in Manipur in India, people thought I would be coming with all kinds of these rigid kind of rules, you know. I told them, I'm not a nation. I'm not a nation deity coming with rigid rules, people. Oh, should, should women, you know, should women be only at the cookers? And should they, should they ever be allowed to expel demons? Well, if God gave them the talent to expel demons, who am I to forbid them to use God-given talent, I said. And so on and so forth. Better be creative. At times, you'll be in circumstances when perhaps you were never in. 
I told you once, well, I have to repeat it myself because I think it's very relevant. When I was asked by one of the ladies, she was a baptism candidate in, in India, she was a Hindu and she dedicated her son to a Hindu deity when the son was born. And the lady was, was desperate because every, every, every day, every feast of that dedicated to that deity, the, the, the lad would just go berserk. The lad would be so demonized. She didn't know what to do. The lady was desperate. What shall I do? I was thinking to myself, what shall I do now? Because she is desperately asking for help, brethren. I've never found myself in such a situation. So what do you do in such a situation? Well, what do you do? Well, you just turn your mind on and you turn your common sense on and you think, okay, this is a new situation. I've never been in it, but there must be a re- there must be a response to that. There must be a solution to that. What would be common? Oh, well, you don't have a textbook or, or a handbook telling you, you know, all the things that might happen to an elder. You don't have a textbook with all the things that might happen to a believer, you know, so you, you don't have a textbook like that. But you, brethren, you always have something that God has given you. He has given you the mind, the sound mind, and the common sense. Use the common sense. Okay, you, I wonder, well, if they dedicated the child to the, uh, to the Hindu deity, well, why should we not dedicate the child to the God of Israel? Huh, wasn't that what happened to Samuel? Yes, and there is the solution. So, you just use what you know in the Bible. Remember how Samuel's mother said, well, if you give me a child, I'll dedicate to your service. There we are. So, we know that a child can be dedicated to the Lord. Yes, excellent. And sure, the common sense tells you, oh, let's dedicate now this child. Let's just renounce this dedication to Hindu deity and dedicate him to God of Israel. Problem solved, brethren. Creatively, creative, you wouldn't have, you have to admit it's very creative. Uh, that was the first such situation in my life. Perhaps there'll be some more. I don't know. But always use your common sense. Please use your common sense. And always remember God gave us common sense. Once you use your simple common sense, with all the knowledge you already know from the Bible and from history, brethren, there is no way, and of course, there is no way that you can make a mistake in some conclusions. And of course, as we want, if you never want to err, there is, uh, there's a good advice in Second Peter, <laughs> chapter, chapter one, I think, when he lists, if you will never err, what to do. And the last thing that he says then, and those who hate their brethren, they have forgotten the uh, forgiveness of their former sins. Right. Anyway, let's go back to Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 8. For this, clothe yourselves with sackcloth, lament and wail. And again, forgive me, uh, I mentioned the common sense. Brethren, if the house of Jude and the house of Israel used every common sense, do you think that they would ever be sliding so far away from God? Do you really think they would? What kind of common sense they use? No common sense whatsoever. The moment they left Israel, they start crying, Oh, we are in the wilderness now. We will not eat the sweet, wonderful onion and cucumbers and all that stuff. In Who? What a kind of priority is that? You eat cucumbers and, and onions in slavery while you're free here in, 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 in the desert and you're given manna you are given the, the bread of physical life, which comes from heaven, straight to you. And they cry for onions and cucumbers, so, and what was else? Melons, water, melons, melons. That's at least in Serbian translation. It might be slightly different in your other languages, but the Serbian says onions, cucumbers, and melons. Oh, poor, poor us, you know. What kind of common sense that is, brethren? What kind of common sense it would be if tomorrow we find ourselves in a place of safety and we start crying for home, how in our countries we used to eat watermelons and this thing and this, that, that. Who cares? If we stay in our countries, they're going to murder us. The new Babylonian empire is going to wipe us out. And yes, perhaps they're in the place of safety. No, it's, it will not be a picnic in the Hyde Park. Yes, I agree. But nevertheless, we'll be safe and sound. And free and talented and knowledgeable enough to make our own food, which God will give us, and, and make tasty meals out of that and perhaps get used to some other cuisine in whatever part of the world would be. We'll get used to those things and everything will be fine. We're safe and sound and we have the last training to go through before Christ comes. Common sense, brethren, keep Pray to God to give you common sense and to preserve your common sense because we live in a totally crazy world.
For this, verse 8, clothe yourselves with sackcloth, lament and wail. Wouldn't that be a common sense in that situation? Sure. Sure enough. For the fierce anger of the Lord has not turned back from us. Well, so obviously it has not. You have the new Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, rising to power. It's obvious that that power is going to destroy you because you have not changed your ways. You see that that empire is becoming a world-ruling empire. So the common sense would tell you, oh, should we not return to our God of Israel? Should we not return? Should we not clothe ourselves with sackcloth, lament, and wail? Yes, that's what the common sense would say. But where is the common sense to the house of Judah this time? No common sense whatsoever. God tells them if you repent, maybe you can be spared from it. But they don't care about repentance. Repent? What do you mean repent? But look, we're God's people. Are we not God's people? You know, well, yes, you are God's people indeed, the house of Judah and the house of Israel. But the problem that you have is that you are misrepresenting that very God to the rest of the world. The house of Israel misrepresented with all the paganism that he practices today, with its Christmases, Easter's, celebrations of birthdays and all that other rubbish, Halloween on the top of all of that. And the house of Judah by endless, endless regulations on how to have your life, and by doing so they basically want to be saved by their works, really. Because, you know, if you don't do certain things, that you can, you're not a proper Jew and you cannot be saved. What kind of ideology is that? And by the way, speaking of spe- uh, salvation by words, but I was inspired today to explain to the Serbian congregation something. We are not saved by the works, brethren. Yes, faith without works is dead. We do have good works because we have faith in Jesus Christ and because the Spirit of God inspires us and drives us to do the good works. And that's how it should be. The good words are the proofs of our faith. But those good words, brethren, keep in mind, they do not save us. They do not save us. What saves us is the belief in Jesus Christ, in his death for our sins, in his shed blood for our sins, which we renewed at the Passover ceremony, and his resurrection from the dead. And I'm telling you this because I'm realizing more and more, I'm realizing what is the tactic of these false Christian preachers out there who keep scaring their flocks with the Sabbath and the holidays and the clean meats. And how do they do that, brethren? I'm coming to realize now. They actually scare the people by telling them, if you are going to keep the Sabbath, then you are actually trying to be saved by your works. If you keep the holidays, unclean meats, you're trying to save yourself by your works. But that's what they, that's the false doctrine they're telling their flocks. Well, we have the common sense and we are just going to say no. The first thing you should all be telling to your Protestant neighbors and others, I keep the Sabbath because out of love for God. I keep the holidays and other things out of love for God because I love and respect them. But no, I'm not saved by those works. I am saved, you tell them straight away, I am saved by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, whose blood cleanses me, from, cleanses me from all sin. Tell them straight away. Because they're being scared by these false preachers. They scared them away from keeping the Sabbath and the holidays and the right biblical stuff because they tell them, oh, those people there, those heretics who keep the Sabbath, they try to save themselves by the words. Wrong. No, not at all. You just tell them exactly, you need to throw back at them their wrong doctrine. Say, no, we are free in Christ. I'm not saved by any works. But I have to do these works. I do these works from the Bible because I love my God out of respect for him. But I'm not saved by it. I'm not afraid that I will not be saved if I don't keep the Sabbath and if I don't keep the holidays, if I don't eat, if I would eat clean or unclean meats. No, 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 I'm not saved by that. No, not at all. But I keep it because I love my God and out of respect for him. But I am saved by Jesus Christ and by my faith in Jesus Christ. Enough. But then I'm coming to realize that we need to defend ourselves as a witness as well against them. Throw back at them their false arguments and doctrines. Not to those preachers. Don't, you know, I'm speaking about the common people. Common people being scared by those false Christian preachers out there. But of all of them, brethren, do not be afraid of them. The truth that we know shall set us free. 
we should not be afraid of those Protestant preachers and Catholic preachers and Orthodox preachers and any preachers anyway and Hindus and whatever. When I was praying in Manipur, when I was praying in, 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 in on our properties of our various members, especially when I was praying for that poor child that was that we had to dedicate. Uh, rededicate the dedicate to God of Israel and denounce his dedication to Hindu God. I prayed very loudly because I wanted the neighbors who are all pagans and practice false religion to hear from this now on that those households, those people living there will be dedicated to God of Israel, not to their Hindu horrible pagan deities. And I prayed so loudly that they would hear me because I felt that was the right way to do because I wanted them to be afraid not of me, but of God of Israel. I wanted them to hear what force, what power from this time on will be protecting those households so that they will be afraid to oppose that power. And if they dared, well, that power itself would just teach them the lesson. So we're not to be afraid of them, brethren. Yes, I knew I kind of risked my life. Yeah, it's not, you know, thankfully that state Manipur is not really Hindu state has few Hindus but enough nevertheless few Hindus but you know I thought it was not all that dangerous I was you know I'm, I'm wise enough but I felt that was the right way to do when it comes to our freedom of religion countries and so on well you're free brethren don't be afraid of all those wrong wrong doctrines and ideas just use your common sense and throw back at the Protestants what they actually preach falsely against us no, we are not saved by keeping the Sabbath. And we are not trembling in fear if we don't keep the Sabbath, we will not be saved. No, we keep the Sabbath because we love God. That's why. Out of our love for God. That's all. Not because we will be saved or not be saved. So they need, we need time for us to finally throw back at them their false accusation against us. No, we are free as you are. As you are in Christ, we are even free in Christ because we have, we have the true Christ who was three days and three nights in the, in, in the grave before he came back to life. We are free in Christ indeed. And so freely in Christ, by, whose, by our faith in him, we are saved. And we freely in Christ keep the Sabbath because we love that same Jesus Christ, the Lord of the Sabbath. We need brethren to be bold and give them that as a witness. That will bring you popularity? No, it will not. But you'll feel free. You'll feel free and you'll feel, you'll feel just free and relieved. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that the heart of the king shall perish, and the heart of the princes, the priests shall be astonished, and the prophets shall wonder. Speaking about the coming captivity, brethren, it's all, the, it's all about the coming captivity. Remember, the end of the book of Jeremiah, the end of the book of Jeremiah finishes when the whole house of Judah is completely taken captive. Jeremiah is remained, remains in the land. He goes to the place called Mizpah to find the king's daughters because he has the commission. Remember, chapter 1, he's commissioned to transplant the throne from the house of Judah to the house of Israel. So, the land is completely destroyed and then we have the lamentations. Lamentations over the destruction of the land. So this is what the whole book, you know, just all these chapters just keep 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 kind of reminding us what is coming up, what is coming up, what is coming up. And then in chapter 13 you have a you have a very clear cut, clear cut statement from God. The darkness, the darkness of captivity is coming upon you, O house of Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. And then towards the end of the book we see. There comes the total destruction of the house of Judah, just like the, just like the prophet, the true prophet of God, Jeremiah, despised and hated by his kinsmen, brethren, who wanted to kill him, even his own family, despised and, 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 and rejected. He was spared captivity. In fact, that very king Nebuchadnezzar ordered clearly his Captains not to take Jeremiah captive or to just ask him whether he likes to come to Babylon or not. And why? Because this man spoke the truth about this land, about the land of Judah. So Jeremiah, of course, doesn't go into captivity because he has a commission to do. He has now to take king's daughters and transplant one of them to the lost house of Israel. So yes, we'll be rejected by our kinsmen and family and whatever, but brethren, we are free. 
We are free in Christ, just as much as any of your neighbors are. We are free in true Christ. Yes, we are saved by faith in true Christ. Just like they believe that they are saved by faith, uh, by faith in Christ. Yes, so we are. So are we. But don't give them the space to think falsely what their, what their lawless preachers, false Christian preachers tell them, oh, those people keep the Sabbath because they want to be saved by the works. Brethren, that's a brutal lie. That's a brutal lie and we are to refute that lie. Very, very simply. We keep the Sabbath because God sanctified it from the very creation week. Oh no, it's not Mosaic law. There was no Moses. There was no Israel. There was no Jews at that time. Only the first couple of humans created and just, you know, the whole creation, the Garden of Eden. And God sanctified the seventh day. That's it. Why we keep it? Because we love our God who sanctified the seventh day. Are we saved by keeping the Sabbath? No. Our dear friends and our dear neighbors and our relative Protestants? No, we are not. No, we are not saved by it. There is no good works that can save us. Yes, we know that. Oh, you think you're smart and you know better than us. No. We know as much as you do that no good work saves us. We're saved by faith in Christ. But we also know what the book of James tells us, that faith without works is dead. So therefore... We have these works out of our love for God, but no, we are saved only, only, only by the faith in Jesus Christ. Brethren, shut their mouth or make your neighbors wonder. Perhaps when they hear your witness, they will think, oh, well, wait a second now. Wait a second. Why is our preacher telling us that these people are, are afraid of not keeping the Sabbath because they will not be saved? Be there, be bold, be there for witness, brethren. It's time. The time is coming too short, but do it. God has called us to be a Philadelphia remnant, to be fired up for the truth. Don't be afraid of all of them. Don't be afraid of those false Protestant, uh, false Christian doctrines and other doctrines. Don't be afraid of the Catholic doctrines, but now we have the book that just debunks them so well. <laughs> and I, I, I'm amazing when, when, when on Thursday, when I, when I opened the email, and there it was, scanned the book, I'm like, oh, is it possible that I have this book in the English language, finally, that I have it, and I'm like, okay, let's see, let's see, no, it was Wednesday night, and I said, okay, it's too late now, it's very late at night, I'm like, okay, let's go on Thursday, what shall we do, shall we send it to here, to there, okay, let's first send it to my brethren, but I'm like, what if my brethren be just indifferent, and say, oh, what's the value of this book? Well, I've told you only what's the value of the book. Now it's your choice what you'll do with the book. But I tell you, I think you should read it and you should be well educated about it and you should not be afraid about it. I heard that there is even a translation of that book into, into Romanian language. Some Baptist member, a Baptist member translated there. I'm not sure if that book has been translated into any other languages, Spanish or French. I don't know. And it doesn't matter. We have it in English. And certain parts of it we can, as the need me may be, we can just be translating, you know, verbally to French, to Spanish, to whatever. Brethren, don't be afraid of all that. I think it's, there is a good chance that that book was translated into Spanish. I don't know. I hope it was. But if it wasn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We'll just fill in the gaps. But please be fired up about it. Be excited about it. Isn't that what God called us for in this moment, brethren? <sighs> Or shall we be just like all those Laodiceans out there, indifferent? Oh, yeah. Oh, you say a book. Oh, interesting. It is interesting, but you know, what's, what's really, what's really, what does that have to do with my life? Well, it doesn't, perhaps doesn't have to do anything with your personal life, but it does have to do with eternal life because we have to warn the world about the pernicious doctrines that the world has been captured by Satan, the devil, since the Garden of Eden. Enough. So don't be afraid of those false preachers. You see, you see how when, when the captivity comes to Judah, <laughs> the prophets shall wonder, of course. The priests shall be astonished. Well, before the priests get astonished in your Protestant world, astonish the common believers. With the same phraseology that I've been listening to, I'm saved by faith in Christ. Oh, but I keep the Sabbath because I love God, you know. No, those words don't save me. No, 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 no. Keep the, keeping Sunday doesn't save me either. Keeping any day doesn't save me. No good work saves me. But nevertheless, I do it out of love for God. And yet, you know, faith without works is dead. So, uh, so there we are, brethren. Be
be a witness to them. Perhaps some of them will start thinking, why those preachers tell me that these people are afraid that they keep Sabbath in fear? If they don't keep the Sabbath, that they will not be saved. And they will start wondering. And why not? Be creative. Use your common sense, brethren, please. Because that's also part of the work of God. God has given us not the spirit of fear, the spirit of the sound mind. Which I often call common sense, yes. So there again in this verse 9, have this key phrase, in that day. So when it is repeated again and again that way, it's just for emphasis. He wouldn't have to put all those ands there and all of the terminology, but it just makes it stronger and stronger and stronger. Every time we read it, we make it stronger and stronger. So leaders of the people shall be astonished. Oh, what a surprise. They should be. Before that, if you don't mind, try to astonish the local population and not leaders, because with leaders, who cares about the leaders? They're deceived and they just have their own political, uh, financial and other agendas. But, you know, try to astonish the common people, brethren. Because now we know how they think. They think what those false preachers tell them. And it's all false and we can refute it very easily. Verse 10. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, surely you have greatly deceived these people in Jerusalem, saying you shall have peace, whereas the word, the sword reaches to the heart. Well, exactly. Just like those preachers deceive these poor people, you know, Protestant people. Oh, those people, they keep the Sabbath because they are afraid. They'll lose salvation if they don't keep the Sabbath. They're afraid they'll lose salvation if they don't keep the Passover. They're afraid, afraid. You see, they keep, they keep convincing people that we keep what we keep, that we keep biblical Bible doctrines because we're afraid. Oh no, brethren, let's tell them and let's show them we keep it because we love God and because we have faith in Jesus Christ who also kept all those doctrines. That's all, but there's no fear. We are free from fear. We are free in Christ, in true Christ, brethren. Let's shock them before, astonish them before the great that day comes. Now, how can they accuse, how can they accuse God and blame God for all this, you know? They say, ha, oh, Lord God, you know, surely you have greatly deceived us because, you know, our prophets, our false Christian leaders tell us peace will be peace or they tell us the, oh, oh, yes, 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 another falsity. What those false Christian preachers tell their flocks, the, the, the your main enemy is coming from the east. It's Russia. It's China. Brethren, they're lying. It's coming from the north. And it's coming from Europe. And tell them, yes, before it's too late, tell them for a witness. Because many then, when they will be found themselves in captivity, may remember that you told them that. And then they'll hear the two witnesses telling him that, the same thing. Telling him the same doctrines that you have keeping now, that you told them that you keep out of love for God, that you keep Sabbath and the holidays because you love God, but that you're saved by Jesus Christ, not by those good works. They'll hear it, and many of them may repent in the great tribulation because of that. Allow yourself to be a creative, good witness, brethren. Allow yourself creativity. Don't, don't fear. Don't, don't think, oh, why should I? I'm just a plain, I'm just, a, I'm just, a, <coughs> I'm just one, a small member of God's church. You are, I know. Jeremiah was a lad of 17 years. When God came and said to him, look, you're going to tell, King, the king, you know, can you imagine to a lad of 17 years that somebody comes and says, you're going to tell the king and his priests and all those men of authority, you're going to tell them, oh, can you imagine that? Who was, who was Amos? He was pasturing the sheep in the field. God didn't find anybody more suitable to tell the house of Israel what he has to told them, tell them. So he told them through Amos. Who was I, brethren, before I was? Who were you before you were called? We were just common people, yes. But we were called by God, yes, indeed. And we were given the sound mind, common sense, the spirit of God. And brethren, all of you are very creative people. All of you are very creative people. Use all that. Don't, don't think, oh, because I'm just a, I'm just only a member of God's church. No, 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 no. You're a creative member of God's church with the spirit of sound mind, with freedom in true Christ, with common sense given. 
by God's Spirit. And yes, we shall we accuse God for having called us to this day and age? No, 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 no. Just get fired up, get excited, please. And use that creativity. Nobody can stop us from doing it. No government regulation, brethren. No human device can stop the sound mind and creativeness that God has given to each one of us. And you see in verse 10, they accuse God. How can they accuse God and blame God for it? Well, you see, God allowed the false prophets to say, and God didn't stop them, yes. Just like he doesn't stop all those false preachers, you know, from preaching all those falsities. Now, so if God allowed something and didn't stop it, it is counted as if God did it. <laughs> it's over and over that we find that, brother. But they cannot say, you know, they cannot say God has deceived these people. No, God did not deceive anyone. God did not say to them that they were going to have peace. He sent them prophets to tell them that captivity was coming and that they will fall captives. But false prophets came all the time telling them they were going to have peace. Whereas the sword reaches to the heart. In some translations it says, whereas the sword reaches to the soul. Well, that is better than a hard one for Protestants to understand. You see, no worries, no sword can harm your soul. <laughs> That's what they believe, you know. A sword may cut your heart, it may stab your heart and kill you, but it cannot bother your soul. Well, we saw earlier that a soul can bleed, it needs to eat, it needs to drink, it can sing, and now we see it can even get a sword. <laughs> poor Protestants, I, poor all those plain, uh, common deceived people. But brethren, you live among them, I don't live among them, I live in a, in a totally different culture when I have to use my creative creativity in different ways. But you, most of you live in, some of you live in, in, in staunch Catholic countries, only one in Spain, but uh, you, most of you live in those Protestant things. Be a witness to those people. You know, in, in your cultures, it's given that you can be a part of a religion, kind of be a Christian and kind of uh, witness about it. In in my country, that's not the case. In in Spain, where Alejandro is, that's not the case. But in your countries, it is. Use it while you still have time to be creative. And refute those false preachers and prophets, because the word prophet in Greek may mean preacher or teacher. Use it, brethren, to refute them in the minds of common people. By telling common people, that's not true what they're telling you about me, no, about us. I don't keep the Sabbath because I'm, uh, you know, I'm afraid that if I don't keep the Sabbath, I'll not be saved. No, that's not true. I'm free. I can choose not to keep the Sabbath. And it doesn't matter whether I'll be saved. But no, I chose to keep the Sabbath because of my faith in Christ and because I love Christ and because He is the Lord of the Sabbath. That's why I keep the Sabbath not out of fear for salvation. I'm not afraid for my salvation. I'm being saved by the sacrifice and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, brethren. Tell them that. It's important, brethren. I feel that I'm not telling you all of this out of... I'm not, I don't feel I'm telling you all of this because, out of, you know, for no reason. There must be a reason for me to tell, for telling you this. It must be relevant for some reason. I, perhaps we don't see yet why, but one day we'll understand. You live in such kind of, uh, culture that you can kind of freely do that and that people need to hear that. Because for, for decades we have been as common members, just small people, what we call, we've been taking all of those false accusations and, and, and just, just keeping silent about it. And we were kind of conditioned that, oh, only the ministers to speak and defend our faith, only the, only the main leading men should do it. Well, brethren, those times are over with. No, 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 not at all. We are submitted to the government of God. We are not rebelling against it. But that does not prevent us from being creative and using our God-given talents. And it should not prevent any of you from refuting the teachings of the false Christian preachers. And those false accusations against you and me. It tells us in the Bible we are not to give consent to the evil, uh, 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 secret, dark, dark things, right? Something like that. I'm paraphrasing it in English. I know the verse in Serbian. But it says that we are not to give consent to that. Okay, don't give consent to that. Tell those common people that are being lied about us that what they're hearing is not true. You don't have to argue about them. You just tell them it's not true. I know that I'm not saved by the works, and that's all. But I have the works because I have faith. I believe 
in Jesus Christ. So anyway, uh, Jeremiah was a super patriot. You see, he cared very much for his people and his country. God told Jeremiah when, when was you know, what was going to happen, but he wondered why it had to be, of course, you know. She wondered why. He, he loved his people. Well, of course, all of you love your people. I love my people. I, we love all the people. So, brethren, yes, being patriots and so on and being common members of the church doesn't prevent us from being creative in preaching the gospel to, for a witness. <laughs> So don't rely on upon the fact that you know we'll be on shortwave radio or that we'll be, oh we have we'll have access to this that and the other. You do do your part as well. Do your part as well. Just by in your many cases, just by just simply testifying to your friends, neighbors, that no, you're not keeping the Sabbath for because you you're afraid you will be you will not be saved. That it's not an issue of salvation at all. That you know that you're being saved by. Again, faith in Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, that faith cannot be just without works. It has to follow the works. And the works are exactly the same works that you're the one in whom you believe, Jesus Christ. Those are the same works that you have. That's why you're called Christian. (laughs) And give them some astonishment, brethren. Give them some puzzle to think about. Some of them may change their minds. Some of them might say, well, wait a second. This is a common sense. How come I can believe this stupid preacher? Many of them will probably say, who cares? Who cares? But some of them may just wake up in the Great Tribulation, you know, and they're taken captive, brethren. So do your part. I felt moved this this Sabbath to tell you this. The fact that we're just common people or common members of the church doesn't mean that we are not creative. Again, Jeremiah was 17. Amos was just uh, a man who was tending the sheep. Ezekiel happened to be prisoner of war. <laughs> prisoner of war. Can you imagine? I mean, can you imagine the situation? He's a prisoner of war, but nevertheless, here comes God who gives him the, gives him the prophetic visions. And my word. And he needs to perform those visions and, and, and the reality of the coming uh, events that are going to pass. He needs to perform them before the other captives, other prisoners of war. All those people could say, well, who are we? Well, here we are. God, we didn't choose God. Nobody volunteered for that position. God chose all of them. He chose all of us. And there must be reason for it, right? Yes. There must be. Verse 11. At that time, it will be said to these people and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of the desolate heights blows in the wilderness toward the daughter of my people, not to fan or to cleanse. You see, but the fury of the Gentiles will be loose at that time. There is always that phrase which ru- runs through the Bible account. Now notice, at that time, a dry wind comes toward the daughter of my people. Not the original bride, not the ancient people, but to the daughter of that ancient people. In other words, the daughter in our time. Verse 12, a wind too strong for these will come for me. Now I'll speak judgment against them. Behold, he shall come up like clouds. And his chair is like a whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are plundered. Benny, how would you term modern warfare and weaponry way back there, several millennia ago? Well, God describes it fairly well there. Chariots and whirlwinds, horses swifter than eagles. It's quite descriptive. Verse 14. O Jerusalem, wash your heart from wickedness that you may be saved. How long shall your evil thoughts lodge within you? The word wickedness is the same as the one down in verse 17. Is the word meaning rebellion for the Hebrew word rasha. But they don't translate it that way, you see. In some places, the word wickedness is translate, translation of the word ra. In other places, it is translated from the word rasha, etc. So it's just inconsistent sometimes. But how long shall you, your rebelliousness lodge within you? Not just evil thoughts, but your rebelliousness, your rebellious attitude. 
so terribly rebellious that in, very, in chapter 13 soon you're going to see that it's so rebellious that there is a point where you cannot do anything with those people anymore. You just have to let them go through captivity because only then, in that situation, only then they can be cleansed from their iniquities. Verse 15, For a voice declares from Dan and proclaims affliction from Mount Ephraim. Now, brethren, Dan, I need to, I need to remind you of the Bible history, and again, you see, Bible history is just, it's very, two important, very elements. History is, in our schools, is dull and boring and terrible and very often falsified, yes. But you see, the Bible history, brethren, is very exciting, so be excited about the Bible history. Because many of you, even by your physical descent, are part of that history. Many of you are direct descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob living in the countries of modern Israel. And many of us who are not living in those countries, in our far, in our back ancestry, most likely also have Israelites in us. But in any case, we're part of it all. We're part of the Bible history, brethren. Because Amos 9.9 would not have been able to be fulfilled if or unless we all are part of all of it. He said he'll scatter the house of Israel everywhere. That's what he did in all the case, in all the nations, which means in all the races as well. Now that's something we need to finally also get grip of and, and get into our minds. Yes, many Israelites once again concentrated in certain areas because they had to fulfill the end times prophecies as given by their father Jacob in Genesis chapter 49 because God told him, well, I'm now going to tell you what is going to happen with your descendants of each 12 tribes in the end time, in the last days. However, nevertheless, brethren, nevertheless, Israel was to be scattered everywhere. So, other than being concentrated in large numbers in those areas where it had to fulfill in the end times its prophesied things, Israel was to be scattered everywhere, in all the races, on all the continents, in all the in all the nations, brethren. So there are Israel, Israel everywhere, numbering we don't know how many millions of people who are today Hindus and Chinese and Serbians and Croatians and whatever other nationalities they might be, Black Africans, etc., etc. But nevertheless, somewhere way back in their ancestry, there is. Somebody who was Israelite. That makes perfect sense, doesn't it? <laughs> because if God says it to all the nations, he means it. He, God doesn't say something that he doesn't mean. And Amos 9.9 9 says it to all the nations. Oh yes, even you in Spain who think that you may not. Yes, even you in Spain. All the last names, some of the last names that are from the fruit trees. It's common knowledge that they, those people are descendants of Judah, by the way. All the Spaniards that have last names named after the fruit trees are of Jewish origin, by the way. One of those little things that people, brethren, have no clue about. <laughs> anyway, so for a voice declares from Dan and proclaims affliction from Mount of Ephraim. Dan, Bible history, Dan in the promised land was the northern, on the northern border of the ancient house of Israel. They are the first territory hit when the invaders would come against the house of Israel. So a voice would come all the way from Dan to Ephraim, the leader of the tribes. Verse 16. Make mention to the nations. Yes, proclaim against Jerusalem that watcher, watchers come from a far country and raise their voice against the cities of Judah. Brethren, this is what God's prophets had to do. Perhaps this is yet a work to be done in Jerusalem and Judea, perhaps. And I'm sometimes wondering whether I will be part of that, I don't know. However, they already have got watchers spying them around. Verse 17, like keepers of a field, they're against hell, sorry, not hell, they're against her all around, because she has been rebellious against me, says the Lord. The house of Judah brethren did not only transgress, meaning did not only miss a mark, the house of Judah was rebellious against God. Verse 18, your ways and your doings have procured these things for you. This is your wickedness because it is bitter because it reaches to your heart. Well, see, in other words, don't blame God. You know, they brought it on themselves. God says to Jeremiah, don't blame you. You have seen your people, what they are and who they are. 
They brought it on themselves. It is their own doing. Here again, the word wickedness is the word rebelliousness. It's not the word evil, which is ra'ah in Hebrew. So, you know, people can miss a mark and God doesn't send you into captivity for that because otherwise all of us would be now captured and languishing in slavery somewhere. And then, but you see, then when you, when you start transgressing, becomes your way of life. If you get little worse, and then you get more evil. When you get as far as rasha, meaning rebellion, and then you get as far as avon, crooked in nature, then God has to deal with you. Just like he had to deal with the ancient house of Judah, with the ancient house of Israel. Just like, just like what he will have to deal with the modern house of Judah and the modern house of Israel. So, here he says, your wickedness has brought you all this trouble. Verse 19. Oh my soul, my soul. I'm pained in my very heart. My heart makes a noise in me. I cannot hold my peace. Because you have heard, oh my soul, the sound of the trumpet, the alarm of war. You know, brethren, what a, what an expression of empathy. What a compassion of Jeremiah for the people. He's so, you know, it's so frightening. He's so frightened. He's, he's so agonizing, uh, uh, you know, over what is coming that his heart is beating rapidly, making noise within him. So the soul can hear the sound of the trumpet. So your soul has to include hearing, <laughs> meaning your ears. Again, so much again about the so-called immortal independence all within you. The alarm of war. Now, there is a good Bible definition, brethren. What trumpet means is the alarm of war by this very definition. And when this trumpet sounds, verse 20, destruction upon destruction is cried, for the whole land is plundered. Suddenly my tents are plundered and my curtains in a moment. Now, still speaking of you know, tent dwellers. So it shows again that revel, uh, what Revelation shows is going to come swiftly, unexpectedly, astoundingly, and yet it is going to be destruction upon destruction. The whole land is going to end up spoiled. The next verse 21. How long will I see the standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? So it's going to last for a while. For my people are foolish. They have known, not known me. They are silly children and they have no understanding. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. So over and over and over again, the people of Israel, the people of the Bible, are the ones that don't really know God. And yet, brethren, as we read more and more, you cannot have doubts as to why, as to who they are, because they believe in the God of the Bible, and yet they're ones, they're the ones practicing Baalism, so it nails them down. They're wise to do evil, this time the word is Ra, and they don't even have knowledge about good. They have no idea what good is. The law is done away with, so, you know, they, so can they know what good is? The law is done away with for them, you know. That's what your Protestant, you know, neighbors and others believe. And their false preachers tells them again that, you know, we keep the law because we are afraid that we'll not be saved. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Shut their mouth, ready. No, we keep the law because we are free in Christ. And because we believe in Christ. And believe that he, and we know that he kept the same law because of him. That's why we are Christian, because we follow his example. No, we don't saved by those works. No, we are only saved by faith in Christ. But faith without works is dead, says James. So we therefore, because we love Christ and because we believe in Christ, we simply out automatically out of by 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 you know, automatic reaction we keep exactly the same good works that Christ kept. <laughs> Just shut their mouth, brethren. Be a witness to your simple witness to your simple common people that you know are being fed lies by these false Christian preachers. Verse 23, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void, and the heavens, they had no light. So this is a good, <laughs> this is a good Adventist verse, you know, because the Adventists ignore the whole chapter. They come to the middle of the chapter, quote verse 23, and say, well, that's the way it is going to be when Christ comes back. 
raptures the saints to heaven, and he burns everyone else on the face of the earth. Now, any similarity between that and the Bible, brethren, is purely accidental. But, you know, you know, everyone has got somebody that goes to heaven. <laughs> well, this is, you know, the only church that does not have anyone going to heaven. The continuing church of God is the only church that doesn't have anyone going to heaven. Even the church of God, Seventh Day, you know, even they have got some guys who went to heaven. Enoch and Elijah, they went to heaven, didn't you know that? They didn't do any such thing, of course, but the members of that church believe that they did. And so does the mainstream Christianity. Jehovah's Witnesses have 144,000 go to heaven that will stay up there until the earth gets renewed. You see, nobody has got it right, really. Nobody goes to heaven, period. Anytime, you know. The earth was tohu and bohu, formless and void. That is the only place outside of Genesis 1-2 that those two words are used together. Heaven's no light. In Hebrew, it is plural, lights. Verse 24, I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled. And all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven had fled. Now this time man here is Adam. Verse 26. I beheld and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. So when Christ comes back and the battle of Armageddon takes place, if we survive, we're going to see it as Jeremiah did. Verse 27. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I'll not make a full end. You see, Seventh-day Adventists took this verse and made a doctrine about 1,000-year desolation. That is a doctrine created by Alan G. White, of course. However, God says in the prophecy that he will not make a full end with them. What land is he talking about in this verse? Well, first Jeremiah said that he saw the earth. Now he says, all of a sudden, the whole land. The whole land of what? The whole land, and yet he will not make a full end. If you're an Adventist, you better quit reading before you come to verse 27. And <laughs> now verse 28. For this, shall, for this shall the earth mourn, and the heavens above be black. Because I've spoken, I've purposed, and will not relent, nor will I turn back from it. So that's, you know, that is when the heavenly signs begin and sun becomes black as well as the moon. Verse 29, the whole city shall be, shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. They shall go into thickets and climb up on the rocks. Every city shall be forsaken and not a man shall dwell in it. Now, brethren, how can the whole city flee when there is no place to go? According to Seventh-day Adventist teaching, they're all obliterated and the whole earth is desolate and destroyed. Now, what city is he talking about here? Jerusalem. What land is he talking about here? The land of Israel. He's not talking about the whole earth. The whole city shall flee from the noise of the horsemen and bowmen. Who are the horsemen? Joel tells us the same nations out of the north, not east, but the north. Every city shall be forsaken. So, brethren, where did they go? This time it is Ish. No Ish in every city. No living man, you might say, living soul in every city. He talked about Adam above. There is no Adam. Now he talks about an Ish. Not an Ish to dwell in any city. Verse 30. And when you are plundered, what will you do? Though you clothe yourselves with crimson, though you adorn yourselves with ornaments of gold, though you enlarge your eyes with paint, in vain you will make yourself fair. Your lovers will despise you. They will seek your life. Your political alliances, in other words, oh dear house of Israel, will despise you. Well, my modern house of Israel, your political alliance called Germany, your supposedly most faithful partner in Europe is going to despise you and invade you, destroy you, and take you into captivity. So we see here he's talking about the land of Israel being plundered. All its cities waste. He doesn't talk about the whole land, the whole earth, as the Adventists would have you believe. He's not talking about the whole earth. Trying not to be dealt with by old lovers. They're trying to fix themselves up, trying to entice them away from doing to you what they are doing, going to do. 
to you, you know, so they adorn with gold, etc. So he says, you can adorn yourself with gold and beautify yourself, it is all in vain, your lovers will despise you and they will seek your soul. That means they will seek your life. They don't want you to know that lovers can seek your soul and kill it, you know. <laughs> Who is the enemy? All those people Israel hired to be allies or lovers. For I've heard, verse 31, I've heard a voice as of a woman in labor, the anguish as of her who brings forth her first child. The voice of the daughter of Zion bewailing herself. She spreads her hands saying, Woe is me now, for my soul is weary because of murderers. So finally, brethren, God is going to give a birth to his spiritual family. And by the way, the good question for those who believe in immortals, how can your soul be weary? For those, good question for those who believe into the false doctrine of immortal souls.